Hey guys, welcome to Midweek Moves. So glad to have you guys here with us, wherever you're joining us, YouTube, Facebook, however. Hey, thank you for being part of our community. I am really excited about today's conversation because today I'm sitting down with uh, a mentor, a friend, a former professor of mine, Garland Ownsby from Southwestern Assemblies of God University. And uh, while well, I'm excited about this, <laughs> because of the way that we had to do this interview, uh, we had some technical difficulties. So I'm afraid that the audio and the visuals won't be quite as good as what you guys are used to here coming from us here at the Midweek Move. But the conversation is really, really good. And we really get into some really interesting behind the scenes aspects about what's taking place in today's chapter. So I really encourage you guys to lean in, listen carefully to what's being said, and take some notes as to what is being said and, and give us some feedback. Let us know your thoughts on what's being said today. All that being said, let's get into today's conversation. Today on the Midweek Move, we're talking about what it's like to trust in Jesus while you're trusting in the system. to the Midweek Move, the show where we take a look at, at scriptures line by line, verse by verse, and we ask ourselves, what does it mean in context and how do we walk it out? And uh, we're so glad to have you guys here with us, whether you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or you've found us on one of the podcast catchers out there, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Hey, thank you for inviting us to where you're at and being part of our community. Today, guys, I'm excited because I'm being joined by uh, someone I like to consider a, a mentor of mine, a, a friend of mine, someone who I find to be hysterical and challenging. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Garland Ownsby. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no pressure there, Dallas. <laughs> and you've got you've got a great voice for this too. I feel I feel like I've got to lower my voice. Just, uh, <laughs> you got a good voice. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, hey, thanks, thanks for inviting me out here today. Yeah, absolutely. So, for those of you who don't know, Garland, Garland uh, is a uh, he's a professor at Southwestern Assembly God University, SAGU, uh, and you're a comedian and a father. And what else do you do? I feel like you do everything out there. I, I'm a husband. There you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All the um, well, and we uh, we host a small group of middle schoolers uh, at our house on Sunday nights. So we're still active in youth ministry all these years later. Right. Uh, get to travel, doing camps, convention, training, all sorts of fun stuff like that. But uh, right right now, my my focus is I've got a I've got a, a one one son that's married, wow. and uh, I've got two sons. One's graduated. One's about to graduate in May. So I'm just prepping to like not have any kids at home right now. So <laughs> you're, you're uh, like, there's a tinge of sadness. <laughs> well, yeah, I you know I used to joke because uh, our one son when he was uh, 15, we had to buy him a new mattress. And the guy at the mattress store kept saying, you know, this one, it's got a 10 year warranty. And I was like, do you have one with like a three year warranty? <laughs> Something, you know, when he turns 18 is going to be uncomfortable. And now uh, now that they're moving out, I'm I'm sad. Oh. I, I love my boys. Oh, so. yeah. I can. It's kind of weird for you to say that that, that age, because I remember when I was a student there 15 some odd years ago that they were they looked younger. <laughs> yeah. well they're they're like all, all my boys are like six foot six foot two they're just they're great great guys imposing they if i went to school with them they would have beat me up so <laughs> <you know. laughs> wow i like that one dark quick so <laughs> <laughs> oh man so one of the things i love about our show here is that we bring in a lot of people who have different perspectives that have a lot of different worldviews and have a unique voice i've mentioned this several times in the past but uh, Garland, I'm excited about you because you have a unique voice in the fact that uh, you are a teacher, and um, but you are currently teaching a couple of specific classes uh, that actually are in the background of this book. What are those classes you're teaching over there, Sagan? Uh, well, I, a few things. I, I teach a class called Bible Study, which um, it's introductory hermeneutics. Right. And I kind of the first day of class, I tell them, I said, you know, my my job is to help you understand the Bible so that you can be the best you know, deacon or the best small group leader, because we have people that aren't going to become pastors in that class. Right. And then the other side is I say, I, you know, my goal is to keep you out of a cult. <laughs> right. And, and so the, we teach them, how do you find the Greek? How do you find the Hebrew? How do you find the historical cultural background? Those sort of things. And, and really trying to empower every student, regardless of their major, that they too can interpret scripture. So that plays a role. But the other one that uh, I don't teach often is it's called pastoral epistles and Thessalonian epistles. And what we're able to do 
with just about every single one of Paul's letters is to go, this is where he was in the book of Acts. Right. So the pastoral epistles are, they're the only ones that we can't go, all right, we know exactly where this is placed in the book of Acts. And that's a whole nother, you know, <laughs> rabbit trail to go down. But, uh, we know when he's writing Thessalonians, it's, it's not too long after the events that are going to happen here in Acts 25. Right. So it's really interesting because these are the background things and, when you understand, this is the reason why it's important to read not just a portion of the scriptures, but the entire context, because the picture becomes so much more dynamic. When you get to the pastoral epistles, you guys need to come into it with the understanding that Paul's been in prison for two years. He's been doing yeah. all these things. And again, uh, I want to encourage you guys to check out last week's episode. We left off with uh, Felix leaving um, Paul in prison, basically for two years, expecting a bribe from him and him not being willing to give that up. And then there's this change of power. And he's like, all right, well, I'm out. See you, Paul. <laughs> Just left him mm -hmm. in prison, which now brings us to chapter 25. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, starting in verse 1, it says this. Now, when Festus had uh, come to the providence, after three days, he went up to Caesarea uh, to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the, of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would uh, summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in, 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 lay in ambush along the road to kill him. What's this happening here, uh, Garland? It, it's interesting because we look and we go, oh, this is corruption, Uh Really, to the Romans, it was just a way of life, hmm. is this is what you did. We know historically 50% of the Roman population was – they were enslaved. Right. Uh, and and it's not the harshness that we think of today. Um, I Even though this is – I do not want to make every – uh, every part of this equal, but it's almost like being a minimum wage worker hmm. where it's easy for somebody to go, why don't you just quit and get a job? It's like, you don't understand. I live paycheck to paycheck, hmm. sometimes day to day. Right. I can't just pick up and leave without hardship. Right. And so what the, um, since there were no, there was no social, um, safety net. There was no Medicare. There was no, you know, Social Security, anything like that. And so you were dependent upon your family or you were dependent on somebody who was really rich mm. to take care of right. you. And that person was called the patron. And so this, the whole Roman Empire, if, if you want to, it's almost like the Godfather, <laughs> you know, it's like, OK, uh, you're the patron and, and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you for a favor. And that favor could be financial. It could be judicial. It could be any number of things. And so once you rose to that level of emperor, you were like a god. Yeah. But then these other governors and these uh, their their object was, how am I going to attain the power? Well, how do you attain power? You get a lot of people that owe you a lot of favors. Mm. And so this this is a case where the Jewish leaders were looking and they were saying, we're looking to Festus as our savior. Mm. He's the one that we want the favor from. They don't need the favor from Paul. Paul is is just an annoyance to them. And if they can just get him out of the way. So it, it's kind of unlikely bedfellows, right. you, you know, um, but he, the problem with this is. When they ask Festus for a favor, what's going to happen is he's going to hold them accountable as right. well. So one day he's going to ask them for a favor. So really, they're they're striking allegiance uh, with someone they don't want to be in in bed with. Right. right. It, it's a really crazy situation you see taking place here because there's a lot of things that we don't see just from reading the text. You have to kind of dig in and understand a little bit. And I think one of the problems that I see personally is a lot of times we will look at the text with an American mindset, a 2022 American mindset. And we're going, oh, this is no, this is there's a lot of deep stuff happening here in the background, which is why we need to read other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the whole the whole issue of power dynamics is is very important in the first century mm -hmm. that if you were a slave, you had no power. Right. If you were a woman, you had no right. power. If you were young, you had no power. If you were not male and if you didn't own property, you had no power. Right. And so you were dependent on those in power to protect right. you. 
especially when the government wasn't going to protect you. And so that that whole power dynamic was just very different than it is wow. today, which I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump Do in it. on this. <laughs> this is the beauty of the church. Anytime somebody's <laughs> like, oh, you know, patriarchy, early church and stuff. And I'm like, no, you don't understand that when Paul writes and he says, neither slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, all, none of this matters yeah. anymore. And when we eat uh, the communion together, when we eat the Lord's Supper together, we're proclaiming that all these earthly institutions don't have the same power and don't give us the same status mm. as being in the body of Christ right. does. Exactly. Which, again, it's a whole dynamic shift of, of everything. Even like when you look at what Paul's written, like he's talking about women in ministry. He's talking about young people doing ministry. He's empowering so many people, which is so countercultural uh, that day. Uh, even to, to this today, mm -hmm. there's some stuff that we've in place that aren't quite biblical. <laughs> but oh, well, yeah. Paul's laid out here. And, and so this whole you know, I, I know we were talking about this, just the idea. It's like, well, you know, this chapter isn't that exciting, exciting because it's just, the, you know, a bunch of people's names and, you know, stuff like that. But really what what Luke is doing is he's going, this is a power right. struggle. This is this is political theater that's ha taking place right here. Uh, you can think of like yep. there's all kinds of movies that people love to watch. There are these like political power play movies. Then this is it. Like these are chess pieces being shifted around the table, and it's getting tight for Paul right now. Like he's really yeah. looking for people, the people most. People love House of Cards. They love Secession. This is this yeah. is that. It's political. Intrigue. Absolutely. So with what's happening here right now, again, they're they're wanting to lay an ambush. They want to kill Paul, and they're they're thinking Festus, you know, just move over here. We'll we'll take care of the situation for you. All right, verse 4. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault with him. And when he had remained among them uh, more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, sitting at the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. Now, before we can see what Paul is happening here, it's interesting because Festus is not, he's hes new to the area. He's taking charge. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. uh, in the fact that he's not just going, okay, yeah, let me do this. It's almost like I'm going to take care of this, but you're doing it on my terms. I, I'm the guy mm -hmm. in charge. You guys come and ask me for favors, but we're doing it my way. And he's kind of throwing it back in their court. Um, but again, at the same time, he can't just hand over Paul. What is stopping him from just handing over Paul to these Jews in this situation? Well, part of this is is showing his dominance as a new mm -hmm. leader, you know, that he is not going to be swayed by the Jewish leaders. Uh, the other big thing is Paul has something those Jewish leaders don't, and he has citizenship. <laughs> and and that we've we've already seen him use this, but um, it, that's going to that's going to be a big deal in his life. Um, we don't know exactly how he got this citizenship. Part of it may have been that, um, again, we can go back to favors mm -hmm. that uh, – <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to forget some names here. But uh, the, Paul was born right. in Tarsus. Tarsus was a battlefield. Mm -hmm. So it was an important, uh, important port city. And so uh, what – I'm sorry. I, I think it's uh, that there was a battle and they took the side of one of the Caesars. And that Caesar mm. won. And as a favor, as a benefit to them said, okay, you guys, you all get right. citizenship. And so, uh, that, that was a big yeah. deal. So it, it would, it would have been uncommon for a Jewish man to have citizenship. And so you can understand, you know, them at first not thinking Paul would qualify, right. but yeah, he, <laughs> he knows Festus comprehends oh, yeah. this again there's a there's a phrase that's been out there that's been used in movies and other kinds of things with citizenship comes benefits and yeah um, there yep. there is a benefit to being a roman soldier at this time and it's interesting because paul he's been writing this line the entire time through of having the benefits of being roman but also having the benefits of being jewish um and mm -hmm. sometimes the downsides of those things also but he always kind of he's almost pitting them one against each other uh, not inappropriately, but he's trusting in the system that's in place where God's perfectly placed him at right here in the situation. Well, he's he's living in the tension that I think most of us have mm. to live in, which is, you know, am I true to myself? 
uh, when when do I look at something that's a situation in my life that's advantageous right. and I can exert that right and yet still be faithful to God yeah. in that moment? You know, so uh, it's, it's kind of one of these things. I, oh, I, I thought this was interesting. The Fort Worth Star Telegram, they did a poll and uh, they they basically were trying to say, um, would our citizens do what the Ukrainians oh, wow. have done if we were being invaded. And the majority of millennials said, <laughs> no, we would not. We would flee. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, so at times you want the advantages of being a U.S. Right. citizen. And yet there are times you go, uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to fight. For it. <laughs> you know? And Paul's, Paul's living in that tension where it's like, I'm going to tell you, I'm a Roman right. citizen. And then he's like, but I follow Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, like, how do we, how does one walk that tension? Because we like, there, there's the tension of like, uh, there's the debate of I'm an American, I'm a Christian. And it's the American Christian or Christian American. How do you walk that line? How do you Garland Owens be walk the line and going, this is how I'm going to live my life as a Christian. Cause there's some stuff that, it's black and white. This is Christianity. There's some stuff that, like, I yeah. don't think Jesus cares about, and we're having to make a decision yeah. <laughs> based off of several factors. How do you walk that line yourself? What way back in the day when I first signed up for Facebook, one of the things they asked was, "What are your religious views?" Or no, what was your oh, political well. views? That's what it was. And I just put, "Jesus shapes my politics, not the other nice. way around." And I think the theme verse. Romans, Paul said, there's none righteous, mm. no, not one. And for, for me, that meant there is no man on earth that is completely righteous. And there is no system, politically, anything that is righteous. And so I think we embrace the the areas that agree mm -hmm. scripturally, and we protest the areas that don't agree yeah. scripturally. And, uh, I'm, you know, the, I think that's the, the value is Paul's in prison for protesting the things that the Roman government mm -hmm. doesn't like. You know, and some of that's just a misunderstanding. Sure. They they misunderstand thinking that the Messiah is somebody that's going to overthrow the government. So so to me, it's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to vote. And I, I know there's the whole thing where some people are like, um, you know, lesser of two evils. God's never told me to vote right. for evil. Um, but I I do not think that. Um, God would advocate for us not being involved in any process just because it's yeah, broken. Totally. <laughs> I mean, Paul's in a process right now that is broken and he's using it. He's walking through it uh, as above board as he possibly can in the situation that he's in. Yeah. You, you know, so, something else to, to point out on this is uh, today when we think about it, we can figure out how much it costs and how much private prisons mm -hmm. make uh, from jailing people. That's not right. their system. And we're going to see this once Paul does end mm -hmm. up in prison. If your family doesn't take care of you, and if you don't have some patron that's sending right. you food and clothing and caring for you in prison, right. you're going to die there. Uh, and so Paul's letters where he's thanking the Philippians for their gift. It's, it's really important because if he doesn't have support from outside, he, he dies. So in, in this sense, when, when he's, when Festus is trying to figure out, do I send him to prison or not? This isn't about really doing the right mm -hmm. thing with justice. This isn't about doing the right thing when it comes to justice. This is about yeah. politics. Like, if I get rid of Paul, how does this benefit me with the majority of people? And the majority of people are still following the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests and the Judaic system yeah, totally. at this point. Totally. All right. Continuing on. Verse 7. Uh, when he had come to the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem, stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul – which they could not prove while he answered for himself, neither uh, against the law. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar. Have I offended in anything at all? 
So they brought him before him. They've laid out all these stuff they've seen lay out before him. But they had nothing to prove. They had no way of saying, hey. In fact, the previous chapter, when he stood before Phoenix, he's like, if there's somebody that accused me, let him show up and tell me the show. Like, show you what I've done. Yeah. And he's laid out the, the three main things. It's the law of the Jews. The temple had its own set of laws in place. And then there's right. the... The kicker, this is what they were hoping would get him killed, uh, violations against Caesar himself, which in that culture, right. if you if you violate Caesar, you're out the door. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and, and if you we go back to uh, the charges mm-hmm. against Jesus, that was the problem. They couldn't find anybody to bring the charges they wanted and, and right. truthfully. And so what they have to do, they had to pay a couple witnesses because under under Jewish law, you still needed two witnesses to corroborate that or corroborate that that somebody had said something or right. done something. Which is so, where the two or more comes from. Um, y- y- yes, yes. And and so with this, it's like, okay, these are serious charges, but you, you don't have any credible mm-hmm. witnesses, you know, to right. come against this. Really interesting how we see this. Uh, a lot would happen to Jesus is actually happening out with Paul at the same time. Like Paul's really suffering similar, not the same, but similar way of Christ of false accusations, having to go through certain political stuff at the same time. Uh, verse nine. But Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor. There's that that favor aspect that we talked about earlier. <laughs> answered Paul and said, "Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before the concerning?" Uh, before me concerning these things. Now, before he didn't let the he didn't allow them to go. Yeah, we'll come to Jerusalem. Why is he suggesting it now as a favor? Well, I think it it again it puts him in a place where they're going to mm-hmm. owe him something. You know, so I wish to do you Jews mm-hmm. a favor. Again, the political right. circus. You know, I do you a favor. Well, one day uh, you're going to do me a favor that's going to benefit me and advance my cause and advance my purpose. Because really, at, at this point, uh, one of the ways that you choose an emperor is uh, it's it's not all mm-hmm. biological. Okay, so in the first century, a person, uh, an emperor, could adopt mm-hmm. a young man could adopt an adult man as his child and say, this is going to be the next emperor. And then you have things like Julius Caesar. You could just take it by coup. Uh, So we don't know. Festus, probably like any of these men, wanted power. So again, it's like, all right, if I go to Mm -hmm. Jerusalem, this is a very, very important city to the Roman Empire. And if I can get the favor of Jews Mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, well, that sets me up. Pretty yeah, well, absolutely. politically. It's also interesting because the, the contrast between the front end and the back end of this whole conversation, it's the, mm, we're not doing it your way. And now he's like, okay, now I'm handing you a favor. Like he's asserting his dominance, but at the same time going, I'll take care of you, but you have to, you have to work with me, play my game. Again, this is the, yeah, all that. Oh, yeah, this is a there. huge, crazy political landscape that's taking place at a, a power place that are, are, that Paul is having to navigate while trusting in Christ. At the same time. Um, and again, I know a lot of people, there's not to get political here, but there's a lot of people that they get angry at the pol- at politics and they try to manipulate things. You can't do that. The system may be corrupt, but you're living in the system and you've got to trust Christ as you walk through. Yeah. Well, and if you look, basically what Paul's saying is, my my hope isn't in whether the Jews right. are happy with me, and my hope isn't whether Rome is right. happy with me. That that's not ultimately mm-hmm. the goal for him. Yeah, it's it's Christ alone. <laughs> yep. Verse yeah. eleven. For if I am offended, I'm sorry. If I am an offender or have any or committed anything deserving of death, mm-hmm. I do not object to dying. Which I think is that's a bold statement. He's like, if I did something wrong, kill me. He's like, I am willing to take the punishment yeah. that's set before me by the legal standards that they're real. Like, if I legitimately have fought, violated these things, yeah, yeah. I, I deserve the punishment. Well, and, and th- this goes along. Remember, uh, Gamaliel earlier went and is just like, listen, if this thing is of God, just yeah, we'll let it 
we'll let it go. And if it's not, it'll fizzle out. And he gave, you know, two other references. He goes, this happens. He's like, we don't want to make martyrs right. out of these guys because martyrdom is what makes a, an issue explode. Uh, and so there's that, but I love that it reemphasizes Paul's ideology that if I live, right. that's good. I, there's, there's a purpose for my life, but if I die, Right. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus. And so it's it's kind of the one thing. It's like we, we can get so stressed out about earth and all the things. I mean, literally. Okay. So I, was, I told my wife, I said, I read an article where the, uh, the U.S. government has updated their guidelines on uh, nuclear this. fallout. Yes. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. And – you know, I told her, I said, well, one of the things that was fascinating is it basically kind of said, hey, if you're not within 60 miles of this, just stay inside. Right. And you'll be OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like I'm, I'm not trying to diminish the impact, but it's like, yeah, unless you're right there in the zone, just give it time. The earth is going to spin and, right. and it'll go away. It'll, you know, fine. But I told her, I said, you realize how many people are dealing with anxiety because of this, it's like, is today going to be, we call the return of Christ, right. the blessed hope, you know, I, I've always thought it's like, all right, if, if I was going to get mugged, you know, people go, oh, there's nothing in your wallet that's worth your life. And I'm going, there's nothing on earth right. that's worth my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can, you can have it all. You can take, you want to string me up? Fine. You want to shoot me in the head? Fine. I, you know, great. So while I'm here, I'll live for Christ. And if you kill me, right, I'll be with Christ. So this whole I'm going to kill you thing. Can't threaten me with a promise. Festus, Festus lost his, yeah. his power again. <laughs> you know, the Jews have lost. They're, they don't understand. It, it, you ever hear this thing? It's like they're playing checkers and right. Paul's playing chess. Exactly. That's exactly you what's know? going on here. Again, this is this is his mindset. He's like. You know, to die is gain in so many ways. Yeah. And he's okay with that. Yeah. I mean, he's okay with dying. <laughs> you know, he's like, this is law. Fine. Here's Jesus. You know, you know, I'll go out telling you who he is. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the beauty about Christianity right. is hope. You know, is <laughs> do whatever you want and life can be miserable. This isn't right. The end. To be continued. You know? so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The rest of verse 11. Because, but if it is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. So, again, he, he understands the law. He knows what's going on. He's like, he's like, there's nothing for them to accuse me of. So, I'm going to go to Caesar. I'm going to the top dog right now. Uh, I, I'm Supreme wondering Court. sort of is he knows that if I go with them, that the ambush is going to take place. I mean, there's nothing here that says that he knows this, but mm -hmm. I, he's smart enough to know these guys might try to kill me. Yep. Well, and and by appealing to Caesar, uh, let's put it this way in, in modern terms, he's yes. in protective custody. Because if something mm -hmm. happens to him on his way to C right. Caesar – and now there are a whole bunch of issues beyond just Festus and his right. his little gang. Absolutely. There. Uh, again, he's got to take care. Festus has to take care of Roman interests first. Roman interests is mm -hmm. don't kill Roman yep. citizens. Plain and simple. Even if you yep. don't like them, you got to protect them. And it's one thing for a Roman to kill a Roman. It's almost like the whole like don't mess with my sibling. I'll I'll mess with my sibling, but you can't touch my sibling, right? <laughs> it's one of those things. Don't touch a Roman. Yeah. We'll touch yeah. the Romans, but you out there, you can't touch Romans. And that's what he's dealing with in this situation. Yep. All right, verse 13. And after some days, I'm sorry, verse 12. Then Festus, uh, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. I think, you know what? Fine. Let's rock and roll. Verse 13. And go. after some days, King Agrippa and uh, Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's uh, case before the king, saying, there is a certain man left in prison by Felix. And it's interesting that he says that specifically. To me, I'm, I'm maybe just reading it too much of it, but I'm going, is he just throwing Felix under the bus? He's like, yeah, so I'm dealing with this thing that was left in my lap by, my, by the last guy. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, cause <laughs> in any case, it's like most of us. We want the credit when things go well, and right. we want to shift the blame when they don't. Mm-hmm. And I think Festus is realizing, okay, this is going to Caesar. Do I really want this to be noticed in right. Rome? That I yeah. couldn't handle this on the local level. And, right. and so I could see him going, listen, I, I'm I'm taking care of this the best that I can, but it wasn't my problem to start with. Exactly. Which is is I, another sign of poor leadership, in my opinion. Own your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> now that, you know, I, we we say that you know an adult. If you're an adult, you don't you don't blame it on somebody else when it really is your problem. Exactly. Uh, I, I was oh dude, I was in class the other day and I was explaining something and um, somebody was having trouble getting some software to work and they're like, so I just don't do it. And I went, <laughs> if your GPS goes out, find a gas station, <laughs> get a map. Right. If you're camping, wait for the sun to rise or the sun to set. Navigate by the stars. I said you've got to learn how to be persistent. You just right. can't give up. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh man. So, but, uh, just kind of a super side story about the whole like owning your mistakes, and everything like that. Um, we were talking about before the show about uh, there's another professor that uh, used to be at uh, Sagu that joined the dark side, gone somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Magruder. And, um, I, Magruder was my preaching prof when I was at Sagu. And I used to tell people, I was like, look, I'm, this is where I learned how to do stuff. And I teach kids how to preach, uh, here at our church. That's one of the things I've done several times is teach a lot of our young people how to preach, how to prepare a message. I said, look, if you, and I tell people when I preach, like, if you like my preaching, blame Magruder. If you don't like my, my preaching, <laughs> it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. But it is true, off topic. I, I, the thing I, I say in youth ministry is, uh, the youth pastor is never going to le- leave the church because he hates the youth ministry. If you mm-hmm. hate the youth ministry, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly. the one that built it. Right? <laughs> so good. Oh, man. All right. Verse, um, I've lost track of where we're at. Um, oh, verse 14. 14. Um, uh, no, verse 15. And about whom the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me. Uh, when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. Verse 16. To them I answered, it is not the custom of Romans to deliver any man to dis- uh, destruction before he is accused, the, uh, before the accused meets the accusers face to face. It has opportunity to answer for him concerning the charge against him. So again, this is him laying all the cards on the table, going, look, I'm handling everything above board as best as I can. This is a terrible situation. These Jews just want me to throw Paul out there, but I'm taking care of the Romans. Um, and in the again, process there, huh? it's in the process. It's not our custom. That's not what we mm-hmm. do. There, right. There's a little bit of an elitist thought mm. there, too, where yeah. we're not like because there was definitely a distinction between Jew and Gentile and the Jews didn't like the Gentiles and the Gentiles didn't like the Jews. And so now the Gentiles are in charge. And it's like, yeah. well, it's our custom. And we know you guys have your customs and the emperor's letting you guys worship the way you worship. But when it comes to civilized people, <laughs> this is how we do it. <laughs> There's a little bit of pompousness, which we're going to see oh, yeah. more here in a little bit. Uh, verse 17. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against of against him of such things, I suppose, Mm -hmm. but had some questions against, uh, against him about their own religion, about certain, a certain Jesus who died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. So he, he sums up all the accusations, their own religion. He's separating himself from the Jews. He's like, this is a, this is a squabble between people of their own type of thing. And then a certain man, uh, Jesus. Now, it's interesting that he says it that way because he's he's going, I don't know anything about Jews. I don't know who this Jesus guy is. He's dead, but apparently he's not dead. I'm very confused. Like, you're seeing his ignorance almost. Well, uh, here's here's one thought. Mm-hmm. Who killed Jesus? Who put him to death? Right. The Roman government. Right. Right? He he wasn't <laughs> He wasn't killed by the Jews, they're the ones that brought the charges, right? right. But he's killed. So how would it look <laughs> for a representative of the Roman government to admit 
that they didn't do their job well and that yeah. this myth uh, of Jesus <laughs> being alive was true. So there's, again, there's some of the political theater there. And obviously he doesn't, he's not a follower of Christ. It doesn't mean anything to him. So right. the, the all he can do is I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the objective facts. We killed him. And this guy says he's still alive. Right. <laughs> you know, so because it, it even in verse, so I was at a loss how to investigate such matters. What good? He's not there. You know, we, what are we going to do? So, right. Because <laughs> part of the thinking was that the apostles had stolen his body out of the grave. So obviously Rome is going to admit, yeah, there, there's no one in that grave, but here's the reason. Grave right. robbers. Yeah. That's common. You know? Yeah, totally. So again, he's just laying everything out there for Agrippa here. Uh, we'll jump down to 21. But when yeah. Paul appealed to be reserved for uh, the decision to, of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till uh, I could send him to Caesar. So that whole being kept, uh, being kept there, it was saying that he's like, look, he's being kept. He's being secured. Nothing's going to happen to him. Again, Romans take care of Romans. Doing my job. And we're going to get through this process how, as quickly as we want to get. Uh, verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. So he's intrigued. He's like, this is a weird thing taking place, which is interesting. I think a lot of people feel like um, in these terrible situations, God should just remove us from him and we should just you know, move on. The fact that Paul's willing to walk this journey out above board as he is, mm -hmm. it's actually opening the door for, for more people to hear the gospel. It's actually giving more opportunity for people to hear who Christ is. And the effect that he has had on Paul's life and others. And um, I mean, this is completely a side type of thing, but I want to encourage folks, if you're going through hard times, it may be an opportunity for you to share the gospel to folks who would never hear it before. What, one of the things that I was reading was about Agrippa is that he had a better familiarity with Jews and Jewish custom. Hmm. And so for him, it was like, Almost bringing in a lawyer with a better expertise, hmm. you know, so Festus is going, I, I'm not really familiar with all this stuff. And Agrippa's right. going, you know, I've got more experience. Let, let me listen to him. That's Maybe I can give you some advice right. with the, the more experience I have with Judaism than, than you do. Yeah. But well, that's cool. so again, let, I'll do you a favor. <laughs> all the favors taking place here. Mm -hmm. Um, Verse 20, uh, 22 or 23. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had yes. entered <laughs> the auditorium with the commanders and the uh, prominent men of the city at, Fe uh, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both at Jerusalem and here crying out that he was not fit to live longer. But when I found uh, that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. So uh, that's interesting. He said that uh, the whole, like he's done nothing deserve. Like I found him he's innocent for the most part. I almost wonder if, Caesar, if he had not, if uh, Paul had not said, let me go to Caesar, he says, not, judge me now, if he could have gone free at that moment. But because he had gone, said, I want to see, uh, I want to go to Augustus, then uh, he was forced, okay, you're going to have to go to Caesar then. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, uh, I'm going to do a little side note. Yeah. I found he had done nothing deserving of death. Do you know what the Greek word is for death no. in that verse? Mm. Thanatos. <laughs> Are you for real? Yeah. <laughs> I had no That's idea. Anatas. It sounds like somebody's name. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> kind of a snappy name. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so it's, it's he he's making that appeal to the emperor, so it's like, okay, well, you know, it's his right. He can do that and we maybe could have resolved this, maybe not, you know, but we we don't know. We don't know what Festus would have done in that case. Right. Verse 26, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought up, brought him out before you and especially before you 
King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. What has he just said in this situ- situation here? Yeah, he's just he's looking for something, kind of grasping at straws. It's mm-hmm. like, well, if I if I send him to Rome, I- I'm not sending him as a someone who's broken Roman law. Right. And so I'm really kind of trying to figure out as a citizen, he has the right to appeal to Rome, but they're I'm going to send him and Rome is going to go, well, this is none of our business. Why, why are you wasting the court's time mm-hmm. with a charge that it, it would almost be like uh, you're making a small claims court in the Supreme Court? Mm. Th- this isn't this isn't really where we handle these things. Right. So Festus is like, I got to I got to have some Roman validity to send him on to the emperor. It's his uh, it's Paul's. uh right to appeal to the emperor but he's going to go there and it's going to be the same charges that are religious and now we're back in the same jesus situation right you know that that we've got are you guys are we going to have to make up charges that this man was saying he was going to overthrow and become the emperor we we got to figure out something to write uh if we're going to send him on to rome yeah so a lot of Again, we said this at the beginning, there's a lot of power plays taking place, a lot of political uh, theater taking place. There, again, while on the surface, this is just a very, okay, this is what's happened. Underneath it, all this shifting, everything, it, it is political theater 101 taking place here. So, Garland, you, you know, yeah. well, uh, there's a there's a really good book. I'm, I'm sure somebody's references, uh, but it's Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. OK, have you heard of that one? I have not. And it's uh, co-written by a professor and a former missionary to Indonesia. Hmm. And so they bring different understandings and really go b- behind the text. But one of the things they say that is very appropriate to what we're talking about is uh the things that are said without being said, hmm. you know, and it's the stuff that's implied because culturally we get it. Right. You know, so like somebody does you a favor and of course in our culture you go, well, thank you. Right. But the thing that's not being said is, well, one day they're probably going to ask you for a favor and you're going to choose whether you do it or not. Right. Well, the thing that's not being said here is, no, Festus, you bring – when they say respect, mm-hmm. uh, remember Bernice and Agrippa show up to pay their respects, as mm-hmm. we would say. Well, it was probably literally payment right. of respect. And so there was probably an exchange there. It's more than just, hey, we just want to say hi. You moved into the neighborhood. So there are things being said, and that's one of the benefits to reading this historical cultural background and understanding what was being said without – any words being used. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So what's your big takeaway, Garland? If you were to sum up this chapter, what's something you would walk out in your own life with this? My my big takeaway is there is there is a system and there is a process, and we're going to trust the system and the process to do what's right. Mm. But we realize that that system and that process are being administered by fallen people, mm-hmm. by sinful people. Yeah. And so ultimately we place our hope in the same place that Paul placed his hope that if I die in prison, which he did, mm-hmm. if I'm executed, which he was, I did the right thing. Right. I did the right thing. And ultimately this world has zero power over my eternal uh, life. Exactly. So good. And I want to kind of expound on that. The He was failed yeah. by a political system and a religious system. Paul was a Jew. He lived as a Jew. He said he was a Jew of Jews. Um, he just believed in fulfillment of everything that Judaism was looking for, which, which was Jesus as the Messiah. And mm-hmm. so he was failed by, uh, he worked within and lived by corrupt systems on every side of life. It's not just like some people there, there's a lot of church hurt out there. It's because people put too much stock in people, not realizing... Yeah. The, their pastors, their, their bishops, their, um, their, their Sunday school teacher, everybody, they're just as flawed as them. And yeah. our government mental people are the same way. And we have to be going, be willing to go, man, I'm so sorry. 
you know, you, 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 you have fallen for whatever reason. Um, and, but that's not going to affect my relationship with Christ. And we have to have grace for people. Be willing to restore people also. Um, but also we have to make sure our foundation is on Christ, not on our person. My relationship with Jesus is not reliant on my, on my senior pastor, uh, on my associate pastors. It's not on the, the president of SAGU. It's not on, um, the, the, uh, any leaders of any religious organizations. And it's not on the president. It's yeah. on Jesus in my relationship with him, period. Yeah, I, that's, it's so true. It's, you know, I, I've said that, uh, you put me in a room with the most holy person, you know, and within five minutes I can get them repenting of something. <laughs> right. And, and it's, we're all imperfect. <laughs> mm-hmm. We're all imperfect. And, um, I think one of the things we need to work on is the way that the way that the world under that they would understand that we're not perfect mm. either uh and being able to communicate that through grace and the way that we interact with them that uh we're we're all less than god absolutely and our only thing is that we have recognized it and to the extent that we need a savior absolutely absolutely so good well guys that was acts chapter 25 hope you enjoyed this conversation it's challenged you we want to hear from you guys reach out to us media hub at thbstreetport.com or uh you can find uh midweek move on facebook reach out to us let us know how this has encouraged you how it's challenged you what's your next step and how can we pray with you like how literally how can we pray with you through whatever you're walking through today uh garland how can people connect with you and uh what uh what are some great things that you want people to know about yeah, uh, well, my, my website is garlandowensby.com, and I'm sure in the show notes or title or something, you'll have the spelling of my name, but garlandowensby.com is uh, my website, and uh, I do comedy. You can find that on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon, all those places. So uh, if you thought anything I said was mildly funny, I can tell you that there's better stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I, I think most of all, the, I, years ago, I felt uh, my calling was to to, to train ministers, uh, specifically to train them uh, to reach adolescents. And so I've been doing that a long time, and it would be an honor uh, to to be able to help anybody to do that. And so the way that we do that is through sagu.edu, sagu.edu, and we have both distance ed and on-campus uh, um uh, programs uh, for all sorts of things, but uh, again, my calling is is training people to, for ministry, and so I would I'd love to have that opportunity to do so. And thank you, thank you, Dallas, and I love what you're doing, and I just think it's cool. There's such a I t- I talk about you in class all the time because oh, wow. <laughs> I yeah, well, I I tell them I said you know, um, I don't know everything you're going to do in the future, right? Because I don't know your personality as well as you and God do. Right. And and so I just think it's cool. There are these people that think doing ministry, it's like somehow you either have to be an athlete or a type A leader type person, or you got to play guitar. And I just love that we have people coming through that it's like, like, you know, you would call it geek or nerd or whatever, but it's like God wants to use all sorts of people. Why? Because there's somebody just like you that needs to see Jesus in you. Word. I appreciate that. So I appreciate you. I, I love what you're doing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Garland. Well, guys, again, connect with Garland if you can. And um, hey, again, thank you for being part. I want to encourage you to share this podcast out. Don't just blind share. But really ask God, who does needs to hear this message? Who needs to hear this conversation? Share it out with them. And I want to take, encourage you to take the next step. Sit down and listen to it with them. Like do the Bible study with them on your own and let us know what, how you grow from it. Until next time, guys, have a fantastic week. <laughs>